haven't been in Singapore for even a whole day, so I'm like in that strange state where you're dreamy and sleepy and everything seems weird and amazing at the same time. So if something I say sounds weird, it's my current jet lag state. Um, so when I come back to London, you should ask me the same question and it would make more sense. So that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Sola Fernandez, as um, Jason said. I work for Mozilla. I am in the London office, so that means right now it's like 3 or 4 a.m. my time. Um, and I'm, I used to be in the DevRel team. I just moved to the Firefox DevTools team because I wanted to make the tools better. So I'm now an engineer manager there. And I'm also Spanish, as you can say. I'm not very, like, um, sounding English very English. Um, so because English is not my first language, I do things that native speakers don't, which is wonder about the language. So when I hear expressions like, it's raining cats and dogs, I'm like, what? <laughs> so I went to the internet and I searched what that means. And it brings you back to an old time where um, the streets were full of rubbish and dead animals. And when it rained, it rained so hard that it would just carry away all the dead animals. So that's what it means that when it's raining cats and dogs. Um, and another expression that has been interesting to me lately has been going against the grain. And so again, I was like, what does this actually mean? And the dictionary says that it's contrary to the natural inclination of feeling of someone or something. It goes against the grain to tell outright lies from the fact that wood is easy to cut along the lane, the line of the grain. And I am a software developer, so I have no idea how you cut wood. So I went to the internet again, and it told me that it was easier to cut along the grain than across the grain. I still didn't know what it mean, because, you know, like even wood that we use nowadays is fake. So I'm like, I don't know. But the internet is amazing. It gave me a diagram. <laughs> so it shows you what along and across the grain means. So I was like, oh, yeah, those timber people, like when they go with the axe, if they go with the axe across this line, it's very easy. You, can, you always see that they are cutting the tree that, in that direction. But you never see them cut on the other direction. You see them, but it takes them longer. It's not like one clean cut. Um, so the other interesting fact that the internet told me is that the bull is also stronger along the grain. So if you give a karateka one of those plants, the first one is going to be harder to kind of like just slice in just one um, hit. The second one, which you can't really see very well, but it's like cut in the other direction. So this is going to break. You can see that this is like total setup. Like if a karateka um, can cut that, you know that it's not a very good karateka. So I'm like, oh, well, that's very interesting. Another thing that the internet showed me is an, a demo of this with the spaghetti. So you can see this is wood grain fibers, and you can see that this is the effect that you will get when you cut with an axe along the direction of the grain. Um, um, so the other final cool thing that the internet told me about wood and grains is that you also need to keep this thing in mind when you apply polish or you get these scratches, which are awful. This is what happens when you kind of like sand against the direction of the grain. So I'm like, oh, this is so cool. Like the grain is intrinsic to the bull. So if you do things properly, you get like very nice finished products. Um, they are really nice to look at. You're like, oh, this is like good artisanal crafty work. But if you don't do that, if you just ignore the fact that wood has grain, you get things that are flimsy, scratch, or brittle, they break. And you're like, hmm, interesting. Um, I was like, like this on my screen, like, yeah, this sounds familiar. Um, this is just like modern web development. We're just ignoring the grain, we're just doing whatever we think is cool, and then everything breaks, and it's like, oh, I don't know what you did here. Um, and all the talks today have been <laughs> mentioning this, like, please don't use Bootstrap, please don't do this, please don't break the browser. So I'm like, this is very good, because you're like telling things that I'm really caring about. Um, so what's the web natural direction? Um, and I'm going to be captain, obvious, but HTML for content, CSS for presentation, and JavaScript for functionality. You would think that people would know those things nowadays, but no. <laughs> um, so when you build with these principles in mind, you're cutting along the grain, which is the good thing, and you're playing to the web's strengths. Um, I will go into more detail, but that's basically what I want to like, hint, um, like and stress today. Um, even if this is just a CSS conference, CSS is so connected to everything. You can't just take one thing and ignore the rest. 
Um, so if you build websites this way, they are delightful to use because you know the browser can do the browser job, <laughs> and authors do their author's job. Um, so let the browser do what it can do, like you know, like stretch things around, zoom in, zoom out, that kind of things. Um, use keyboards, that kind of things that browsers let you do when you don't mess with the browser. And then you can just fill the gaps for extra things that the browser doesn't do yet. And maybe it will do in the future if enough authors ask the browser vendors to do that. So some developers build against the web natural direction. They say, I want to have full control. Um, but what happens is like they interfere with the browser, and you end up with those things like the little cross that Chris was mentioning, where you cannot press ask, you cannot press the cross, you cannot tap away because there is no normal interface. Like nothing works as you expect. So that's very frustrating to use. Um, or they go for pixel, pixel perfect UIs. This is bad, but it's even worse on phones. When you have an Android phone and you get a, an iPhone UI because they want to make things native, or when you have an iPhone and you get material design and you're like, I don't know what this is anymore. This is all very strange. So this is the unca uncanny valley of UI design. Um, or you get this long time for requests to render where you're like waiting and waiting. I can feel this a lot because I use roaming a lot when I'm traveling around. And when you're in roaming, apparently your data goes through your server in your country. So it takes long. <laughs> so you're like waiting and waiting, and eventually you just give up, especially when you don't get any render at all. When something breaks on the meantime, there is a timeout, nothing renders. And you're like, OK, fine. I just wanted to see the menu on your website, but now I'm not going to your restaurant. Um, so the other thing that bad developers do is ignoring aspects that exist in the platform. It's like ignoring the grain. They assume that there is no network, like things magically come to your device. Um, they also ignore that the browser really does many of the things they are implementing. Um, they also ignore other uses. Like, I really like the talk from Chris, like make things work with universal design. It's a bit like the kind of things I'm worried about. Like, they're like, oh, it works fine, my computer with my super accurate um, um, mobility. But you try to give them to other people, and you can't, they can't use the products. They're like, I, this, is, this menu, this rollover menu is too fast for me. I can't focus, and it can make people cry, really. <laughs> um, they also ignore that the web environment is unpredictable and it's unknown. It's not just about um, people using strange phones or people using things on 3G or 4G or whatever. It's also about people installing plugins on their browsers and also about people using websites with things like assistive technology stuff, like screen readers or like even reader, reader mode is a version of um, assistive technology. Um, you can have so many things in the environment that you cannot really trust the JavaScript you wrote is the JavaScript that is going to be executed. So if you expect that your whole app is going to work because you assume this kind of like idea of pure JavaScript environment, you're going to like set fall for a disaster. So what happens is that they re-implement things that already exist badly, and then they create junk, accessibility, things that cannot be used, or things that just literally drain battery, and it's like all terrible and bad. And it makes me so sad and so upset at the same time. Um, and this is all because we want to make an app. An app. <laughs> so the problem with this is that the developers of these kind of apps are like, I really hate web development. This is so awful and terrible. Um, they, they go to Medium and wrote a post about how terrible web development is nowadays, and it's like so awful. And then people hate using these kind of things because they are so against users. They're anti-users. Um, so I've been here too. I am at fault at this. Um, I have had bosses insist that things had to be pixel perfect and things like that. I'm like you know, the web is not about pixel perfect. And he would be like, no, it has to be perfect. Um, so yeah, we've been there. It's, it's a thing that happens. Um, but the thing that really makes me really upset is when I'm a user, because I'm like, you could have done it the other way, and you still chose to do it this or a terrible way. So I'm here more as a user than as a developer. Um, so 
you would not think that this is a solution, but there is a solution. And it's making websites, not making apps. And I'm just like, again, Captain Obvious. <laughs> um, the thing is that the websites, like building websites, has this almost 30 years old of, of experience behind. So if you come up with a break for, sorry, a framework, <laughs> if you come up with a framework, it's not going to have those 30 years of experience and standards and consensus and discussions. So your framework is not going to last for longer than the website. And a properly built website is going to last longer than any JavaScript framework you could possibly build. Um, so for example, I want to show you something really cool, which is the first website that I can still open with my current browser. Can you imagine opening nowadays browsers, like, sorry, nowadays websites with current, with, with this um, first browser? It would be impossible. It can't do. Um, so it's, it's really some, some food for thought. So how do we do this thing? Because I'm just like being angry here. <laughs> so again, Captain Obvious. You need to start by architecting your content and designing your content. So what is what your users need? Like, you can't start saying, we're going to use this framework. That's not how you start your content. You need to start thinking about what do the users need. Um, do they need a single web page app? Maybe they just need, if it's a restaurant, sample menu, opening times, booking form, something like that. Like, that's the kind of question you should be asking yourself. Um, do I need to load a full templating engine to render a blog? Or maybe you could just render that on your server and cache it forever so you don't waste energy in the world. That kind of ideas is what, that, what I'm going through, etc. cetera. Um, so once you know what you want to actually mean, I mean, this is, I'm just telling you about progressive enhancement. But once you know what you want to build, you just use HTML. And it turns out that HTML by itself has lots of features. Um, Cool thing is that advanced browsers are going to be nicer to the users, um, but older browsers will be just functional. So they don't know as much. They just ignore whatever they don't know about. So for example, if you have an anchor and you say H, ref, tell, la, 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 and a phone number, if a browser knows about that, when you click on that phone number, it will say, I mean, if, if the browser knows about that and you're writing this on a phone, they would be like, do you want to call this number? And this is just extending something that the web reader does, which is showing you links. Um, if you use pattern in, in form inputs, you can have regular expression validation built in the forms. You don't need to pull a library to do this thing. Um, if you use input type number and you use this thing in a device like a phone as well, which is like cumbersome to type numbers and things with a very um, small screen, it will bring up a special um, dial kind of like a style keyboard. So you make things easier for your users in the proper context. So you're kind of like giving the browser hints as to what kind of content it is. And the browser or the user agent um, is going to be like, OK, I'm going to, to help you do these things. Um, and that works when you use HTML correctly. If you just use divs and spans and you don't mark up things properly, the browser has no clue of what you want to do, so it's not going to help you. Um, and then CSS, this is what we're here for. Um, uh, we need to go bottom up again. Like, it was very cool that Rachel also explained this thing. Like, you need to start with the most basic browser. And I would like to say that every browser can be a basic browser at some point when you don't get all the styles loaded or when something kind of like misses out the load. Um, it can become a basic browser. So, and even when sometimes you get uh, like a mobile website URL sent to your desktop computer, and there is no detection or whatsoever, you end up with a basic kind of like version of the website. So I want to still get proper content. So you need to start here. Um, and make sure you use the same defaults for those basic browsers. Like many people just um, specify the gradient, but they don't specify the base background. So when you try to use some websites with browsers like Opera Mini that strip out the complicated CSS properties, if you didn't specify um, the background and the gradient says this is a dark background and the text is like black, you're going to get like black over black, which is not exactly what you wanted to do. So you're, you're like making things difficult for yourself if you don't use a cascade properly. Um, also, please don't use proprietary prefixes, but if you really need to, use preprocessors so you make sure that you don't miss out on any uh, prefix. And again, use support. If that's something that you have to learn today, please use support so you don't send things to browsers that don't understand them. 
Um, and always be learning. Like, the cool thing of CSS is that the syntax is always the same, more or less. It's not changing a lot. Um, so new things that you learn, you can use. You don't need to forget the things that you really knew. And also, if you understand CSS, it's going to be like great, because you are not going to just like copy things from the internet. It's going to be really good, because then you can write things your own. Um, so like, I guess re-watching Rachel's talk and that kind of thing is going to be really, really cool, because you can like experiment with the things that she's been suggesting and like learning um, really how things, like the new things work, and just like and learn the new things, the old things that we used to use. Um, and this is my special for you. Feel proud to be a CSS developer. Like, you're a real developer. No, don't, tell, don't let people tell you, oh, you're not a real developer because you're just writing JavaScript. Like, when well, you're not writing JavaScript, you are a real developer. And writing good CSS is really valuable. Um, if you write good CSS, you can have with so many lines of bad JavaScript code. And it's going to be also fast and more performant because the browser is going to like, be like, oh, CSS, I know how to do this thing, and I'm going to be hardware accelerating this, and I'm going to use uh, less energy. So that's going to be better for mobile users, which happen to be a lot of people. So feel proud to be CSS developers. You are great. Um, so then, when you are like, oh, yes, I'm a CSS developer, when you go to JavaScript, please be really wise. Again, the way with great powers comes great responsibility. JavaScript can break things really badly. So please don't send things to browsers that don't know about those things. So this, this polyfill service by the FT, they will make sure that um, things are like properly, like all the gaps are properly polyfilled. And you can also configure that so it doesn't send the whole thing or like the whole list of polyfills. This is my personal, personal advice as a programmer. Please use feature libraries over frameworks. Like maybe you're just going to use a fraction of all the powers that the framework is offering you. So maybe just try to use the little thing that you need. Um, and if you really must, though, please use frameworks with accessibility built in. Not just like <laughs> I saw a framework the other day that say, "Oh, mobile is not in the top of our priorities nowadays," and I'm like. Are you from the 90s? Like, seriously? Um, and remember that no framework is a silver bullet. Like, just by choosing Bootstrap or React or whatever you want to use, it's not going to sort out your issues. Like, if your content is badly designed, no framework is going to fix your content. Um, things to watch out for is ads, tracking, and all stuff that interferes with browsers. Um, it's really interesting to know how or to learn how r browsers rendering pipeline works and how, you know, like when resources are downloaded, how it affects with what the, the browser is doing, how, how things are stopped, waiting for all things to pass and that kind of thing. And especially if you're going to be inserting ads and things that your boss is going to tell you, oh, we really need to track this thing. You need to bring them up. Like every time you add a new beacon, this it's going to slow things down. Um, so they need to know that when they don't make money with the website, there is a reason behind that. So if you could um, measure things, if you have data, you can argue with them. Every time we add this thing, we have this drop in sales or whatever. So you need data to be able to remove um, the crap later. Um, and also watch out for content that will just not display if JavaScript breaks. Um, like, for example, if all your content requires loading a big chunk of JavaScript and parsing the thing, it just won't display in basic browsers. So my, the crux of this is if you really want to replace something a browser is doing, you better know what you're doing. Because <laughs> honestly, browsers are a complicated piece of machinery. So the thing is that when you're like young and ambitious, you think you can do better, but often that's not the case. So the reason the browser is a big thing is because there is a reason for that. So important. This is not um, like a server-side conference, but this is important as well. And it's like it's not sexy or cool or whatever. And I hate sexy applied to technology, but server-side is important. Um, because in basic browsers and in like all, in like all new fonts, server-side rendering is still faster than every possible JavaScript improved performance, whatever. Um, just giving people render HTML, and they can just, they can just like, OK, I know how to do this thing. Whereas everything else that you can put in the way is going to have um, a very long time for requests to render, and people are going to abandon your website. So 
and you need that thing anyway. Um, React lets you do this. I mean, the reason people use React is because they can do this isomorphic JavaScript instead of using PHP, which is not fashionable anymore, apparently, even if it keeps doing the job. Um, and server-side validation is still required. So if you get data from the outside world, you need to still validate. So why not do like everything together? Um, again, let me um, stress this. Server-side validation is still required. <laughs> You can't trust people from the outside. You can't trust that people are running your JavaScript front side up and not getting junk injected because you know there are viruses that can take over browsers and send crap to people through um, the browser, even if they are authenticated and things like that. So don't trust front end all the time. And also, in, this is very funny, but this, it's very easy to get gains from this, from checking the server configuration for caching and just also things like uh, enabling compression. Um, I used to work in a place that were ser we were serving, like this was before iPhone existed, and just enabling JZIP made us like super fast, like we saved so much in bandwidth. And, and I said that it was before the iPhone because my boss had one of those Nokias that were super advanced back in the time. And he was like, now I can open this website on the phone, which I couldn't do before, because it was, it was just timing out. But with JCP enabled, it was short enough that he could just get the whole thing. So it's, it's funny. It's like just simple, easy things you can do, and then you get really good gains. Um, also, related to uh, faster transmissions, consider HTTP2. There's a talk about this later. And then you require HTTPS for HTTP2, <laughs> and also for privacy-sensitive APIs like service workers and la la la, which I really briefly mention later. Um, to diagnose, you can use developer tools like the um, the network panel, um, and you can see the headers have been returned. When the, um, I don't know about the Chrome one, uh, but the Firefox developer tool has a thing where you can see how long it takes. Um, how, how much data you get on the first and the second request, so you can see if things are being cached properly. Uh, and of course, the web page test. And this is hard, I know. <laughs> Imagine me, like I haven't really slept much. Imagine if it's hard. Um, but the truth is that writing software is hard. No one told you this was like a funny, well, it's funny, but it's hard. Um, but at least we don't have to build the browser first, in theory. <laughs> that would be really hard. And, and the thing, again, browsers are Amazing. Um, we, I, had a, I had an intern this, this summer, and he was uh, implementing a feature in Servo, and he was like, Servo is a browser. Um, and he was like, it's amazing. Like, he was just implementing double click. But just like we get these kind of like interactions that we, just, we don't even think about. But browsers do so many things for you already. Um, we periodically ignore them for some reason. <laughs> Um, and the list of features is just growing and growing, like all the cool CSS features that have been discussing today, like all the ligatures, all the grid and flex layout. We can do so many great things, and we can be so innovative on the web and, and have all this freedom. Like when I started doing web development, we had to take images of custom fonts and slice them and align them in a table and use N N M MBSP elements and things like that. We don't need to do any of that anymore. We can be really semantic and very clear of what we mean. This is great. Um, we have things like offline support, so you can turn any website in a thing that works offline, so you don't need to suffer with like roaming and things. Just your, the, the, the directions to your hotel are already in your phone, so that's cool. Um, you can engage people with push notifications with service workers as well. Um, you can even install the app if you really are very engaged with this website and with this website, because all this is built on top of a website. So what that means is because the way of browsers work, if they understand these things, they are going to offer this option to you. If they don't, they are still a website, and they still work. So when I hear people saying, I'm just not going to support Safari, Safari is the new IE, I'm like, are you crazy? Like, what about all the iPhones? And they're like, oh, they don't support service workers. I'm like, but, but that doesn't mean that you have to make your app, app dependent on just service workers. Like, you can still have a website. It just won't work offline because, you know, Safari. But the rest should work. So that's, that's the 
thing I want to like convey today, like if you build a website, you can add more features on top, and it's not like an all or nothing, like it is with apps, like if I make a, an Android app, it's either you have an Android phone or you don't have it, you can't use this app, or if then iPhone comes with a new version of a kind of hybrid between iPhone and um, what's the other thing, iPad, um, and then you have to build a version of the app for that new thing. That's ridiculous. Um, but with a website, you just get one thing that works everywhere. And it's like, <laughs> it's totally mind blowing. And I don't understand how people are so keen on using still apps when you, we have all these great things. Um, so it's exciting times to be a web developer. And the thing, again, is that we, we can reach so many people. Like, I don't even know how many people are on Earth, but there is so many people that are already connected to the internet. And the millions of common new internet users, they are actually not using iPads, and they are not using iPhones, and they are not using Android either. They are using like, no, I mean, not fancy Androids. They're using like cheap Android phones, and they have like small data plans, and they don't want to install apps. They just want to have their photos and, um, you know, like access websites because they just don't have a space. They're really cheap phones. So, and the other important thing is that the browsers they are using, you haven't even heard them before because they are like totally custom things that the couriers are building and things like, uh, like UC browser, which I've never used because I'm a bad developer. Um, so, that's, that's the whole thing. Like, if you build in a way that you're prepared for the unknown, you are safe. If you're trying to just use things that you control or that you are familiar with, you're like set for failure. Um, and I say I work in Mozilla, and we love the web. Um, so we are researching and exploring the future of the web. Um, one of the things we're working on is Servo, which is a new browser. It's parallel, safe, and performant. Uh, it's a new browser engine. It's written in Rust. Um, the whole idea is that because it's written in Rust, it's a very safe language. So if there is a crash, which is rare, um, uh, user data should not be put in danger, so people cannot steal your bank credentials and things like that. And the other cool aspect of Rust is that it's very parallel by default. Um, so we are trying to make sure that we are using all the, um, all the hardware in, in, in mobile browsers, which means that um, so mobile browsers have more cores, but each core is slower. So normal kind of like traditional browsers are designed for monocore, maybe a graphics card. And the problem is that that's not very efficient in mobile browsers. So with server, we're trying to build a new thing from the ground up that uses all the cores in phones. And it's way more efficient because you can use things in parallel. Um, so we can do things like web render, which is a new CSS engine that makes things like, watch for this, you can use left and you can use top. And there is no performance issue with that. It's amazing. Um, you don't need to be thinking about, oh, I need to use translate instead of left, because left is not going to be fast enough. So with web render, you can ignore that thing. And the other cool thing we're doing is we're taking things from Servo and moving them into Firefox, so we can have like the feature in the present. Um, so we're probably starting with some parts of the URL parsing, which is uh, a, a huge vector for attacks. Like There are many vulnerabilities that are due to URL parsing. So we're taking things like that. Uh, web render is possibly one of the things that is coming to, the, to Firefox soon, um, because obviously we want to make CSS as fast as possible. So you don't even need to wonder, oh, is this going to be um, bad or slow? You, we want people to just write normal CSS instead of having to think about what the browser has to do to render this thing. Is it going to be bad or is it going to be slow? Um, and more things that don't make any sense in this conference because this is all purely JavaScript. Um, so thanks, and I'll be around probably having more coffee because I'm like starting to feel strange. <laughs> um, I think I've been really fast, but I'm not sure. Time is very elastic for me right now. <laughs> all right, thank you, Soledad. Um, it's a very great talk about making websites and not applications, and just reminding all of us not to ignore all the different things that we have in our browsers, and skip to the app and feel that it's all the best thing out there. The browser is still the best. And by the way, how many CSS developers here? Give me, give me a raise of your hands. CSS FTW! All right, um, before I, um, any questions for Soledad? 
I shall take the mic and run around if you have any questions. Come on. Come on. Hi. <laughs> I see someone scratching their head. <laughs> All right, all right. So if there are no questions now, I'll have one question to ask. Oh, okay. All right. There's so many things in browsers nowadays, like, there's like so much for us to take in right now. So how do you even begin learning all of this stuff? Like what would be a proper roadmap for someone who is new to the web, uh, different browsers? How would you recommend for us to learn all the stuff out there? That is a very good question, and I would like to know how to answer that properly. <laughs> um, we have um, the Mozilla Developer Network, which is um, the documentation uh, site. We are trying to write guides for developers who are new, because most of the content they can find in how to write HTML is from the 90s or the 2000s, and it's like it doesn't really have good practices anymore. So we're trying to write. Uh, new guides, which are more like modern web development. Um, I think someone told me that Code Academy was really great for them, but my problem is that I started doing web development in 1996. So I'm like, I don't know, it's natural to me. <laughs> so yeah, maybe I should just speak to more beginners so I can understand their pain better. But yeah, we're trying, in developer uh, Mozilla.org should have content for beginners. Yes. Thank you.